The trademark of three-phase electrical machines is a rotating voltage space vector created by a three-phase power system. This voltage vector is responsible for the rotating flux vector. The flux vector can be pictured as a fictitious rotating magnet in the machine and is indicated by this red arrow. If we place a real magnet in the machine that has this fictitious rotating magnet in it, the real magnet will follow the rotating magnet. Not just somehow, but locked into the rotating field. While synchronous machines use a permanent or at least a constant magnet in the rotor, induction machines rely on a temporarily induced magnet. This magnet is only there when the rotor changes its position in relation to the rotating magnetic field. This movement is responsible for changing magnetic field within the rotor. The rotor is built like a squirrel cage consisting of short circuit loops. As a consequence of the magnetic field change in the loops, voltages are induced in the squirrel cage short circuit loops. If we want to get down to the basic function of these short circuit loops, it is sufficient to look at just one single loop. In a way, this approach is comparable to the analysis of one cylinder in, let's say, a 12-cylinder combustion engine. So, here it is, the one-cylinder, single-loop, squirrel cage rotor of an induction machine. Now we start rotating that short-circuit loop in an already turning magnetic field. We towed that loop faster than the rotating field. This is done by this tiny locomotive. The slower magnetic field tries to slow down the rotor, hence withdrawing mechanical power from the locomotive. This is generator operation. The alternative view on this situation is also valid. The short circuit loop connected to the locomotive pulls the outer magnet behind itself. In any case, we need to apply a decelerating torque to the outer magnet in order to keep the low rotational speed of the outer magnet at its original pace. If the outer magnet is created by a three-phase voltage system, this decelerating torque results in the generation of electrical energy that flows into the power grid. Let's have a look at the details though by keeping an eye on this torque meter. If we break down the separate phases of the appearing and disappearing magnet, we must start with the induced voltage V, shown in the diagram in blue. Peak values appear at peak change of flux, which is the case for 90 degrees and 270 degrees for total loop position. Low slip and with it low frequency of the induced voltage mean the inductive reactance XL in comparison with the resistance R is negligible. So voltage V, blue, and the resulting current I, red, are in phase to each other. Therefore, the largest force or torque between rotor magnet and outer magnet appear when both magnets are positioned perpendicularly to each other at 90 and 270 degrees. At this moment we have the strongest force of attraction between north and south pole and the strongest force of repulsion between north and north as well as south and south. That translates to maximum torque right at this point in time. The force between the magnets vanishes completely when the field lines of the rotor magnet are lined up with the outer magnetic field. Luckily this happens at a time when there is no magnetic field created by the loop. It is clear the torque pulsates proportional to the rectified induced voltage. Please be aware that a sinusoidal wave doubles its fundamental frequency after rectification. For motor operation. The outer magnet runs faster than the rotor. A breakdown of the phases reveals a similar behavioral pattern as in generator operation. 
but it's clear that for motor operation the rotor pushes in the direction of rotation, thus supporting the direction of movement. In other words, this wagon here is pulled by the rotor. North attracts south, south attracts north, and south repels south and north north. For a single loop we end up with this pulsating torque indicated on this meter. This time the outer magnet has to be pushed to keep its rotational speed. If this magnet is created by a three-phase voltage system, this is done by withdrawing power from the grid. Let's get to the most interesting part now. On the right we see the operation of a synchronous motor. There are two ways to look at the operation. One is the direct view with that rotating picture. The other one is the linear view shown below. What we see down here is the movement of the outer magnet indicated by the upper magnetic poles north and south. That part is designated as BM, B magnet. The lower part is BR, B rotor. So the rotor magnet is locked into the rotating outer field delayed only by the torque angle that is dependent on torque and rotor field strength aka excitation. The torque angle is theta p which is lagging for motor operation. It cannot go below minus 90 degrees for cylindrical rotors. In stationary operation the torque is constant and totally smooth. Field frequency and rotor frequency are equal. If we compare that to an induction machine, the first obvious difference is that the rotor runs slower than the outer rotating field. This of course is necessary. The slower rotation allows a change of magnetic field in the short circuit loop and consequently the induction of voltage as shown earlier. Since we use just one loop, we see a strong pulsation of the torque. If we look closer, it becomes obvious, even without the Fourier analysis, that the pulsating magnet field has a fundamental wave that is locked in the rotating field with an angle, which I call here delta theta. For a negligible phase delay between induced voltage and current, this angle is minus 90 degrees. However, if the frequency of the induced voltage increases because of increased slip, the inductive reactance XL grows, thus pushing the phase angle between current and voltage back. Consequently, the effectiveness of torque creation decreases because of an increasingly bad timing of the current peaks, which are rotor magnet peaks as well. These peaks appear no longer for a perpendicular position of the loop with regard to the rotating outer field. It is important to notice the increased total impedance counteracts the greater induced voltage with higher frequencies, thus keeping the current at almost the same level as the current at breakdown torque. Breakdown torque current is in the vicinity of the maximum current although it has the best total effect regarding current value and timing and therefore is not really the greatest current possible. So increasing the slip towards infinity does not let the current grow to infinity but pushes the current phase back to minus 90 degrees and delta theta to minus 180 degrees at, as mentioned, roughly breakdown torque current levels. For high slip rates, accelerating and decelerating torque sections are equal, resulting in an average torque that is zero. Hope you enjoyed the video. More on breakdown torque in induction machines and how it can be accessed even for higher slip rates soon. See you next time.